<laughs> okay, so it's really good to be with you, and um, we, uh, we haven't been here for a while, and uh, Shoba, I came home one day, and Shoba said she was praying, and she said, I feel we need to be with Michael, and so she made it happen, so we are here, okay? As I begin to share the word with you today, I will say some things that you probably never heard before. And I don't want you to close your minds to it. I want you to keep your minds and your hearts open. I promise to tell you only the truth. Okay? Amen. Only the truth. Only the truth. All right? As we know from the Bible, the truth will set you free. I'm seeing a lot of new faces. We get to know each other as we go along and a lot of familiar faces. I didn't realize this gentleman was related to you, Denise. So we'll get to know each other a little bit. Okay. So were we able to get the um, message up? Yeah, we can bring it up. Today, I want to ask you a question, and this is my topic, what we're going to be discussing, talking about sharing from the Word of God. What is God really, really, really like? I know we all have our ideas about God. I know we've all heard about God, and we all have read from the Scriptures, and we've all come to our own conclusions about God. But what is God really, 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 really like? We come to church on Sundays, we pray, we sing the songs, we listen to the good messages of the pastors that we encounter. But do we truly know what God really, really, really is like? Okay? Um, can we go to our first set of notes? So, it's very important that we understand God. Because our understanding of God is what defines us. Our theology is reflected in the way we live and how we respond to crisis. All right, I use a big word there, theology. But your theology is really your understanding of God. What understanding you have of God, that is called your theology. And everybody's theology varies. Personal, personal views on God varies, right? But the truth is, what you believe about God will be reflected in your life. Everything you say, everything you do, the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you live, the way you act, every single thing will be fleshed out what you believe. So the thing is, if you believe that God is an angry God, guess what? You will begin to reflect that nature. You will begin to demonstrate anger. You'll be angry at your wife. You'll be angry at your children. You'll be angry at the dog and the cat. You'll be angry at everything. And let me tell you something. The world is full of angry people. You drive on the roads in Trinidad and it's the amount of angry people you meet. And sometimes we make some of them angry too, Pastor. <laughs> but ang anger is something in people. I, I, I try to understand where it comes from. And it all comes from an understanding if I believe God is angry, he's angry at me, he's angry at sin, he's angry at the world, he's angry for what we've done to his son and all these things. If I believe in an angry God, I will be angry too. That is why it's so important that we have a correct understanding of who God really, really, really is. It is so imperative that our theology lines up with the way we live and how we respond to crisis. And our sister was talking about another crisis this morning and she's been through many in her life. And it's like crisis after crisis after crisis, and she's still here. And she's still here for a reason. Amen. Amen. Yeah, and you've been through some crisis, and sometimes we face some crisis, and we, we crumble under the crisis, and we get angry with God, and we curse God like Saul. We say curse, like Job's, told, Job's wife told him, said, curse God and die. Because we can't handle the crisis because our theology wasn't strong. Our understanding of God wasn't right. It wasn't strong. It didn't help us to navigate the crisis. You're trying to tell me that Jesus didn't understand crisis? Of course he did. That's why his name is Christ, right? He understands crisis. <laughs> he went through, what do you think you go through some stuff? He went through the worst of it. You know what it is to be betrayed by the people closest to you? You know what it is to have everyone leave you and you are alone in your moment of need? Tell me he didn't understand crisis. All our theology must line up with the true nature of God. 
If there is something we believe about God that is not lining up with the nature of God, it is a wrong understanding. God is not an angry God. He's not. He's not angry with you. He's not angry with our forefathers for what they did. And he certainly isn't angry with Adam. I know some of us are. I know some of us here, we are still angry about Adam and Eve, and they put us on all of this. But guess what? God isn't angry. He never has been. And he never will be. The more you discover about God, the more you understand yourself and each other. You truly want to understand who you are. You truly want to have good relationships with people. Then you got to know about this God. You got to understand his true nature. Because if you don't understand his true nature, you want to understand yourself and you definitely want to understand me. And so we will always get each other wrong. And that causes a lot of friction between people. That's why a lot of people leave our church, Pastor. Because they have a wrong theology. They believe God is one way and he is not that way. And so what you tell them, what you say to them doesn't line up with what they think or feel or believe or heard from somewhere or read in some book somewhere. But it must line up with the true nature of God. And if you are to that point where you are so angry that you leave, then something is definitely wrong with you or your theology or your understanding of God because God wouldn't do that. God doesn't do that. He doesn't do anything that is against his nature. He cannot operate outside of his nature. Correct. He doesn't. So God doesn't hate he doesn't get angry. I know we think God gets angry. I know we think we anger him a lot. But I assure you by the end of today's meeting, you'll begin to think differently about this angry God. You'll begin to see him for who he really is. Because he's not angry. He's not. And we may have gotten ourselves in some trouble and done some crazy stuff, right? Who here didn't? Who here didn't do some crazy, look my brother here. Who here didn't do some crazy stuff and gotten into some trouble, right? And you still think God is angry about that? Some things that happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, however many years ago. And we still think God is angry about that? He's not. He's not angry about that. He's not angry with you. That's not in his nature. That's not who he is. We need to understand this God all over again. Let me tell you something. It's less, this is like meeting God for the first time all over again. We meet him all over again for the first time. Okay? Let's, to, let's talk about this God. You see? Understanding human nature. Can we go? Proverbs 23, 7 tells us, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Let me tell you something. Whatever is your theology will affect your thinking, your thoughts, your ideas, your ideologies, your idea of what marriage is, your idea of what friendship is or what relationship is, your idea about life and work and family. All of that will be affected by how you think and how you think is affected by your theology. What is the current state of your mind concerning God? I tell you what, I tell you what, whatever is your current thought about God, that is what is affecting you. And you may not have had victory in that area yet, because that's how you're still thinking about it. You may not have overcome that problem yet, because that is your thought about it. But for every one of us here, we must understand that as we think in our hearts, that is who we are. So we live out by our behaviors or attitudes or relationship one with each other. We live out what we believe. 
So when I meet you, when I engage you in a conversation, you are telling me what you believe without telling me what you believe. I see it in your life and in your action and in the way you relate to people and how you treat the pastor and pastor's wife, how you have regard for the house of the Lord, how you regard God himself. In other words, you tell on yourself. You tell on yourself and you can't hide it. You can't. You can't hide it. Because what's inside is fleshed out on the outside, Pastor. I, I don't know if you'll invite me again, right? What is the current state of your mind concerning God? And I'm again talking about if you believe in an angry God. I know you're going to tell me. You're going to tell me, well, in the Old Testament, God allowed Israel to destroy other nations and so on and so on. And right now, Israel is in a conflict with some nations and so on and so on and so on. But tell me, in today's world, is that any good? Uh, the bombing of children, how can that be God? How could God be involved in that? And people support that. And that tells me you believe in a wrong version of God. God is not about killing people. I told you before, God will not do anything outside of his nature. When Christ was in the earth, when he was tired and weary and he couldn't make anymore, a group of children wanted to come and meet him. And the disciples drove them away. Because the disciples didn't yet understand the true nature of this Christ. And what did Jesus say? Let them come. Let them come. We serve this God and we worship this God and we still don't know this God. We are worshiping a version of God that we have created for ourselves. He is the creator God, but we have created him in our image and likeness. We have made him like us. Like a man to be angry and to seek revenge and tell people it's justice. We are not living the image of God in the earth. We are trying to make God in our image. There's a famous line people like to use, God don't sleep. Well, we know he doesn't sleep. But you are using that in the wrong context, friend. You are meaning that God will seek your vengeance. Yes. I know you're going to tell me vengeance is mine, said the Lord. I know you're going to tell me that. God is not out for revenge. If God wanted revenge, none of us would be here. You think you would have gotten away? Not one of us would be here if he wanted revenge. He's not about that, okay? So what is the current state of your mind concerning God? You're going to be re-evaluating everything you know from the first day you heard the name Jesus and the first day you went to Sunday school. Re-evaluate everything you know because everything that was told to us wasn't all true. Everything that was told to us was handed down through different generations and through different, passed through different church systems and so on, and so the doctrine was altered. Now it's up to us to find out the truth. I said I will tell you the truth and only the truth. So help me God. Let's go to our next verse. Romans 5.8. Let's talk about this God. Who is this God really? What is he? What does he do? But God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Wait a minute. You mean he wasn't angry with the sinners? I know we like to tell people God is angry at you for that. I know we like to tell, hold that like a big stick over them. You know, God is going to get you. God is looking out at you. God sees all and he knows all and he's omniscient and omnipotent and omni everything. He is. But he doesn't use his power for that. 
What is the sense having all the power of God and using it for a petty thing like spying on people, their sins? Uh, you have the high-tech system officer, the most high-tech system in the world. And what you use it for? To spy on people, to see what they're doing wrong, uh, to listen in on their conversations. Is that the God you serve? Trust me, if that's the God I serve, I don't want him. I don't want him. I want this God. This is the God I want. A God who commands his love towards me, that even before I heard his name, Christ died. You mean when I was doing all those wrong things and so on, he still died for me? Yes. Yes. Let's do a throwback. throwback. Let's throw back to the garden, right? Let's throw back to the garden. That's where it all started, right? So here's Adam and Eve. And Eve picks God's apple. And you don't get to do that. You don't get to pick God's apple and live. <laughs> and be bold enough to eat it. Now God is going to be angry, isn't he? And here comes God. So you mean after they did all the wrong things, he still came? You mean after I did all those wrong things, he still came after me? You know, we have this version of God that God is after me. But a big stick. He's not chasing after you with a big stick, sir. He's after you because he loves you. He is mad about you. He's not mad at you. And he is feverishly running you down, not to beat on you with a stick, but to tell you that he loves you. And he said that even before all of this, even before Adam and Eve did eat God's apple, Christ died. Because the scripture tells us that the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Long before any wrong came into the earth, there was God. There was God. This is not the God that we think about all the time. This God loves me so much. Let me tell you something. We can't even begin to understand the length and the depth and the breadth and the height and the width of God's love for us. Because our minds have been so bombarded by all the wrong things and that God will get us for every little thing we do. God is not out to get you for anything wrong. What he wants to do is to envelop you into himself and cover it. You see, we have preached a message of this angry God, to fear God. Brother, you better fear this God. We are afraid of hell and hell's fire. But we've never told people, you see, that was a driving force, to drive people out of hell, to drive them into church, to drive them into heaven. Is this okay? Is this okay? Yeah. But we've never preached the pulling power of his love. We've never preached the power of his love that would have pulled people. You know what Christ said? He said, listen to me, friends. When I am lifted up, I'm going to draw all men unto me. And that lifting up meant his hanging on the cross. He didn't say when I'm lifted up, this half will go to hell. And this half will get to come at me in paradise. He didn't say that. He said, I will draw all men. And none shall be left behind. I know we like to tell people left behind is a nice word to use at church, right? I know we like to tell people a lot about being left behind. Well, the only thing being left behind is our wrong version of God. Let's leave it behind. How about that? How about we leave our wrong versions of God behind, yeah? Because of what good is it to me? And of what good is it to God and to Jesus Christ that 
however many millions get left behind. How good is that? <laughs> How could God call that a win? How can we say Christ has won it all? When hell is full. Well, if you still believe that. That's another story for another day. But let's talk about the love of this God. Jesus is the tangible manifestation of the love of God. You want to see love? Jesus came in a bodily form. We don't, we don't, I mean, Christmas coming up very soon and we love the time of Christmas. It's magical. My wife is crazy about Christmas. But the whole purpose of Christmas is this. God showed his love for humanity. Because the angels declared peace and goodwill. They never came to say death and destruction and hell fire. Never. Peace and goodwill to all men. All men, all men. Jesus is the tangible manifestation of the love of God. Love personified. You see, we like to believe, I mean, we believe this. God loves us. Yes, he does. He loves us. But God himself is love, which is different. It is who he is. It is not just a characteristic of him. It is not just a feature of his personality. It is just who he is. And it is the reason why he does everything. It was his love of us that Christ came and went to the cross. You know, there's this thing we say. It wasn't the nails that kept Jesus on the cross, you know. It was his love for you. Because even though he was feeling the pain in his body, and listen to this. He had at his disposal all the power of heaven that he could have called upon and consumed the Roman army and the Roman emperor and everybody else around him who were chanting, crucify him, crucify He could have done it. And he stayed on the cross and bore the pain. Because you know what, Brother Paula? He saw you. And he said, you know what? I'll stay here and finish it. I'll finish it because I've seen down through time this brother will be here and this sister will be here and this brother will be here and this brother will be here. And he said, you know what? I'll stay. Because he said, I willingly lay down my life because I have the power to pick it back up. Are you telling me Christ will go through all of that? And still see so many of us go, not possible. Not possible. There is nothing you can do to make him love you more. Think about this. No greater love had any man than a man lay down his life. Is it possible to have a greater love than that? To lay down your life for your friends? He did for you, brother. He did it for you. He did it for me. Because this is the power of his love. So powerful it is that he wouldn't spare anything for you. And when we begin to see this God for who he really is, because he is the God of love, God is love, it begins to transform us in our minds because as a man thinking in his heart, so is he. And when we begin to become transformed on the inside, we'll begin to be better on the outside. Because now we can love people who are unlovable. We can forgive people who are unforgivable. And we will tell ourselves, I'm not seeking vengeance. I'm seeking reconciliation. Understanding the power of his love. 
will transform your life. And you'll begin to live like Christ lived. Isn't that the goal? Isn't that the goal? The goal is to live like Christ lived. But how did he live? Did he seek vengeance against those who were after him? He didn't. You know what was his greatest vengeance? Here's this. If I have, if you are my enemy, you know what's my greatest revenge I could get on you? To make you my friend. To make you my friend. And when you become my friend, you'll tell yourself, why was I an enemy to this man all along? Why was this man my enemy all along? And that is how Christ got his revenge. All of those who are against him and after him became his friends. And now I am a friend of God because he's called me friend. There is nothing you can do to make him love you more. Now this part is going to shock everybody else. There is nothing you can do to make him love you less. I know you were told that if I did these wrong things, God won't love me. Well, Adam did some wrong things and God showed up for him. David did some wrong things. God still showed up for him. Abraham did some wrong things. God showed up for him. Well, Peter, James, and John didn't hold back, did they? <laughs> Peter certainly didn't hold back, did he? He let them have it. He gave them a good telling off. And Jesus still came back for him. Why have we been told and why have we been telling others if we do certain things, God will love us less or will not love us or has a special place, you know. We like to tell people that have a special compartment for you in hell, you know. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a special place in hell. Your, your ticket book. Your <laughs> you have a special reservation for you there, you know. But, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen. I'm going to tell you a joke. A tell, secret, a secret, a secret. Hell is empty. It is. Hell is empty. Now, don't get angry with me, you know. I know you wanted that person to burn real bad. I know you wanted to look down from heaven and see them burning. Because <laughs> Thanks for your honesty, sister. I know. I know you wanted to see them burn real good. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hell is empty. And that should set you free. Because some of our relatives who have gone on before us, because we were still wondering, did they make it, Lord? Did they make it? I'm here to tell you, hell is empty. You know how I know? Jesus went and emptied hell. He emptied it. And he shut the door once and for all. Hell is not your destiny. It was not made for you and it's not meant for you. Now, don't go and live your life any old how you please. That has consequences. Not hell consequences, eh? but it has consequences. If you live a wasteful life, and we'll talk about the prodigal son in a bit. If you live a wasted life like he did, that has consequences to it. But his end wasn't hell, right? But there are consequences. But if you begin to understand God and this message that I'm trying to teach you here, you won't do it. 
You won't. Now, you won't do anything wrong because you're afraid of hell. You won't do anything wrong because you're afraid God is after you. You won't do anything wrong because the love of the Father constrains you. You know what that means? Because I understand his love so much in me, it has put restraints on my heart. I don't want to do anything wrong to displease this loving God. I just want to do the right thing. And that is why in marriages and relationships, uh, the wife loves her husband, the husband loves the wife. No, there is no problem there. They have full confidence in each other that nothing wrong is going to go here. Because our love keeps us together. I didn't get any amen, Pastor. I didn't hear the amen there, Pastor. There is nothing that you can do to make him love you more. I know we like to tell people, you know, come to church more, you know, God will love you more. Pray more, God will love you more. Sing these songs, God will love you more. Give more, do more. It's a company called Do More. To join the Do More group, right? Join the Do More group of companies. Let's do more. Let's see if God will love us more. <laughs> Pastor, you caused this. You invited me. <laughs> Let's join the Do More group. You know why we're going to do more? We're going to do more because we love more. I'm not going to do more to escape hell or to get some favors with God. God, you see what I did, right? Now you owe me a favor or two here. Put it on my card, right? So I can cash it in when I need it. God is not your ATM. I wish you were. <laughs> God is not your ATM. You can't put it on your card and then cash it in when you want. But guess this is how it's worked. This is how it's going to work. We love him so much, we don't mind. We love him so much, we don't mind. We will do more. And we're not expecting any reward in return. But you know, he's such a good God. You know what he'll do? He said, I know you didn't do it for any reward, brother. But I will reward you. I will reward you. Because your heart was pure and you did it out of a good heart. And this is just who he is. He is a loving father. So you do more because you didn't want more. You do more because you're just good. And he says, because you're good and you do more, take this too. That's a good deal, right? That's a good deal. That's a good deal. That's a good deal. You can't do anything to make him love you less. Let me tell you, let's throw back to Garden of Eden again. Adam did the unthinkable. He ate God's apple. Adam ate God's, <laughs> we know it's not an apple, okay, I'm just joking. Adam ate God's apple, and still, it didn't make God love him any less. Because God came and spoke to him, and he said, friend, what have you done? Now, you can't fix this for yourself. You know what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to fix this for you. The scripture tells us, read it, the scripture tells us that God clothed them when they realized it. God clothed them. Isn't that an act of grace? Isn't that an act of mercy? Isn't that an act of love? Now, if he was the angry God that we were preached to, he would have wiped them out maybe and start all over again. He would have already thrown them. I know you said, well, yes, he tell him to leave. But yes, he tell him to leave because he didn't want him eaten from the tree. The other tree. So just to prevent him from eating of the other tree, he just had to step out a bit. It wasn't that God kicked him out. He had no choice. You see, our actions bring consequences that God himself cannot stop. You brought it upon yourself. God had nothing to do with it. And then, you know, we have a lot of people that said, well, God, you should have seen this. No, you should have seen it coming. You went out and you did some stuff. And now the problem is happening here. And God, come and save me now. He says, no, save yourself. Oh, gosh, I'm just kidding. He will help you. He does. He does. 
That young fellow, well, we like to call him the prodigal son. I like to say he's like every one of us. That young fellow took all his father's money and lived a wasted life. Well, if I was that father, he can't come back in here. Yeah. He not crossing my gate. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like all you don't understand what I'm talking about, right? Oh, God, come now. Come now, come on. Especially we of East Indian descent. He didn't have no place in my will. I'm going to change that will in the morning. <laughs> and fixing that legally. Yeah, he can't come back here. He can't come back here. He can't come back here, Pastor. Look what that man do me. You know? Oh, God, I hope I ain't talking about nobody here, Pastor. That's not intended there. Eh? And and that's not intended there. Eh? I don't come and tell the pastor you're changing your will. Oh, Lord Jesus. Why are we talking about this here? Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Listen. There is nothing you can do to make him love you less. I can't even seem to get past this. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. Nothing, 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 nothing. You mean if I go and do all the wrong things in the world? No, he wouldn't love you less. But you're going to bring a set of consequences that will come cascading upon you. You'll destroy your life. You'll destroy your marriage. You'll destroy your children. You'll destroy your family life. You'll destroy your work life. You'll destroy yourself. And then tell me in the end, is it worth it? God will help you. But you had already gone through all of these and you'll have all these scar marks to show for it, brother. You'll have all of these things etched into your memory that you want to forget. And you wish that never happened. Well, I'm telling you now, don't let it happen, right? Right, so don't say you won't want. Oh, there is nothing you can do to make him love you more. So does that mean I don't have to come to church? Um, well, let's think about that for a minute. So you mean I don't have to come to church and he will still love me? Yes, he will love you. But if you don't come to church, you don't get to learn more about fixing this life that you live. You will only be able to live out of what you have. So coming to church now is not a chore. It's not pastor to call me. Pastor, stop calling me. Pastor, stop texting my phone. Pastor, well, I'm pastor. Give me a chance. Now leave me alone. Watch how you filling up my texts. Watch how you filling up my phone. I don't know. Oh, pastor, I ain't talking about nobody here. Yeah. All right. Okay. Jesus. I block the number. I block, I block him. I block him. He can't call me again. He can't call up. Jesus. Listen. There is nothing you can do that will make him love you more. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. That's just it. Now, don't give yourself license to go and live a freestyle life now, okay? I'm not telling you to do that. If you do that, there are consequences to bear. And you have to tell yourself up front, am I willing to bear those consequences? All right? So you will have to make that decision, right? Just as God gave Adam the decision to eat of the tree or not eat of the tree. How are we doing so far on time, Pastor? We good? Okay, let's get into a few more. We can get into a few more. Okay, we were taught to pursue half hard after God. God was not lost. We were, you know. <laughs> we like to say, you know, I found God 10 years ago. Yeah, like God was lost. I found him when I found Jesus was the best day of my life. All that is good. But Jesus wasn't lost. We were. We were lost in our minds. You know, we lost our minds. We're just now finding it back. You know, we were all insane because we lost our minds. And God is now fixing us. You see, the scripture told us that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. So even before you were here and even before you did anything wrong, Christ had already died for your sins. Okay, let's, so let's fast track. So you mean... I don't have to come to church. I don't have to receive Jesus. 
you have to receive the message of Jesus because it is what opens your mind. It is the message of Jesus that transforms your soul. It is the message of the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ, that fixes your life. You know, we used to tell people, come to Jesus and all your problems would be solved in a sort of way that is true. But we expected it like that. You don't get fixed like that. You, you lived your life for 40, 45 years like that, doing things a particular way. You think that gets fixed like that? Now you have to be retrained retaught and it has to reprogram pastor thank you and that comes from a systematic study or teaching from the word of god you don't just get up one day and you live a good life that comes by a systematic continuous teaching and understanding of the word of god so give yourself to learning not just two hours on a Sunday morning. You need more than that, right? You need more than that. You need a daily dose. It's like taking your vaccine shot or your daily vitamin pill. You need a dose every day. It is what will make you immune to the things out there, sir. The word. It makes you immune. Okay, so God wasn't lost. We thought we had to work ourselves up into his presence, and he was right there all along. Even in the garden with Adam, right? We see that. We need to have an awareness of his presence now. You know, I like to talk about this external God. Jesus, help me here. There's a song we used to sing a long time in church. Reach out and touch the Lord. Wait, so you mean he's out there somewhere? And, you know, Pastor, just trying to get a grab on to Jesus. He's passing by. Come, Pastor, walk with me. <laughs> pastor, yeah, Pastor, yeah, Pastor. You're walking. Use Jesus. You go ahead. You go ahead. You walk. You look, Jesus, come. Jesus, reach out and. Thank you, Pastor. This, this is madness. Jesus isn't passing by. He isn't the outside God. He isn't this external God. You know where he is? <clears throat> right there. This God that we tell, reach out and touch. He's here. We have to reach in. We have to reach in. We worship an external God. That makes him a stranger. That means we don't have a relationship with him. All the other religions worship an external God. I mean no offense to any religious body here. Please forgive me. But when we perform RT and puja and so on, this is an external God that we are worshiping. Christ lives in us. The Christ in us is what manifests itself outside of us. Yes, yes, yes. And that is why people can go to any temple or even a church, a Christian church, and still live different yes, yes. from what they pray or say or taught. Because they're living by an external God, not a God from inside. Christ transforms you from the inside out. Where religion tells us that God is outside trying to come in. He's already in. Okay, he was right there all along. Have an awareness of his presence. Listen, when you're going through a difficult time, my sister, when you're going through a difficult time, know that God hasn't left the scene. Because if he's in me, where is he going to go? If I take him with me wherever I go, when is he going to leave me? We are not praying to an external God. The God we serve lives on the inside of us, is it? All right, let's go to another scripture. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. See, he's not about to throw sin on you. He was there reconciling you into him. 
He said, if I will be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. I will draw you in me. So you become the enchristed ones. And that's why we say Christ in me is the hope of glory. He's got to be in me, not outside of me. Right? I don't worship the Christ outside of me. I worship the Christ in me. Let's get into the story. Let's talk about this story. I hope we can close here, Pastor. Luke 15 is the story of this boy we call the prodigal son. And this is the story. He's already gone his way, taken his father's money, lived a wasteful life, spent all of it, and now he has nothing. This is the problem. This is not God judging him. This is not his sin catching up with him. You know, we like to say these, throw these things out loosely. God judging them. Um, his sin's catching up. Look how the wrong things catching up with him. Listen, what they really mean is the consequences of what he did wrong has finally come. That's what I've been telling you. God is not about to destroy you for some wrong things or punish you for some wrong things. Those things have a way of eating away at you itself. And God didn't cause it. Let me set you free. Let me set you free. If you are sick, or if you have been sick, or if you have lost loved ones, it's not God punishing you for anything. A loving father doesn't punish his children like that. My brother, I say, see him? I'll fix that. I will throw some sickness on him. You'll see how fast he run back in church. That's man's thinking. That's us making God in our image and likeness. A true God, the true God, the true father of heaven will say, this is my loving child. But I can't protect him from this one because he caused it on himself. Now, I will help him, but he must go through these things because he already starts the chain reaction. That's a domino effect. They call it a tip one, and all keeps toppling over. And it has to come full circle. A lot of the things we go through, we did them to ourselves. We like to blame others, but we did them to ourselves. Because Adam said, it was the woman, Eve, whom you gave me, O oh God. Remember that as you put her here. Remember God as you give me this wife. And she make me pick your apple. <laughs> and then Eve says, not me, Lord. What's this snake there? <laughs> oh, jeez. This is huge human ingenuity. This is how we work, you know. Nobody will fast up and say, well, I did it. I did it. I was wrong. Lord, this is going good, huh? How long are I going to have, Pastor? Okay. This son found himself in a place he shouldn't be. Think about this, right? His father is a wealthy man, multi-millionaire. He drives a Mercedes Benz. He lives in a house like a five-star hotel where his servants serve meals every day, three times a day, seven-course meals, Denise. And this young man finds himself in such a predicament, he wants to eat the food that the pigs are eating. Can you tell me how far he has fallen from grace? See how far he's fallen from grace? And God didn't do that, you know. He willingly left. And whatever came upon him, came upon him as the consequences of his wrong choices. It wasn't God punishing him. But God didn't go and pull him out. No. You mean his loving father, the wealthy millionaire, didn't send a Mercedes Benz to bring him back? No. At any point at the time, the father could have gone and get him, you know. He didn't. He didn't. But one day it dawned upon him. You know what he remembered? He remembered the love of his father. My father is a good man. 
and he treats his servants very well with respect and they eat the best and they are servants. I was a son. I know I can't go back there like a son. So I will go back like a servant and be treated like a servant. So here he is. When he was still a long way, still a long way off, his father saw him. Why does the scripture highlight that the father saw him first? You know, if it was God Road and you see this young fella coming up, pull up, I'll stop him by the road there. Hey, where you going? But you can't go back there. No? <laughs> that man still vexed with you. You can't go back there. He give the servants um, instructions not to let you cross the gate. The father saw him first because he needed to prevent that from happening. Because if anybody had blocked him on the road and told him so, he would have gone back. So he came to himself and he remembered the love of his father. And his father also loved him because that's what he was doing. He was looking out for him and he saw him first and his heart pounding. He ran out and embraced him. Whose heart was pounding? Whose heart was pounding? Father's heart was pounding. Father's heart was pounding. Your father's heart has been pounding for you to return. Father's heart pounded. He ran out. He embraced him and he kissed him. And the son started his speech. You know, he prepared a speech. You know, yeah. But they go back home. You just can't go back home. Just so, you know. You had to prepare your speech. Well, pa. You know how it is. <laughs> I had to come up with something real good here. You know. Gotta come up with a good one. Well, ma, you know how this be when you're young and thing. <clears throat> but I learned the error of my ways, you know. Okay, back to the story. They started the speech. Father, I have sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. You know, we love to show that by God. God. <sighs> Can you ever forgive me? Oh. And roll on the ground a little bit, Pastor. Yeah, when we have a little altar call here. You roll. This. You know, in the church, we have what we call the holy rollers, right? <laughs> I say, if the light on rolling, open the door, Pastor. <laughs> I know you're not going to invite me again, so I'm going to take full advantage, okay? Open the door. Trisha, you stand by the door. You open the door and let them roll all the way up. <laughs> and let them keep rolling, okay? Okay. <clears throat> I have sinned before you, and I don't deserve to be called your son. <sighs> A well-rehearsed speech, right? He taught it up real good. Taught it up real good. Let's go to the next slide, sir. But the father was. <sighs> Do you think God cares about any of your words of, you know, yeah, and your tears and your rolling on the ground will move him? No, sir. No, sir. You know what moved him? You know what moved him? This is my son. He was lost for a while, but now he's found so the father basically ignored him sometimes god will ignore you i say but god how you answer that prayer yet? god how you... i'm just ignoring it because it doesn't make any sense i am your father and i will give you my good pleasure i'll give it to you so stop rolling on the ground and crying and begging and pleading and in Jesus' name. You know, we like to use in Jesus' name a lot, right? Stop that. Listen. But the father wasn't listening and he called to his servants, quick, bring clean clothes and dress him, put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And once you get that, that means he is a son again. A son is a son is a son will always be a son no matter what he did or where he went or how long he was away. He don't have to come back with a rehearsed speech for me of, Lord, will you forgive me? Can you find it in your heart, Lord? 
Like if God's heart is very small. Can you find it in your heart, Lord, knowing that he already made provision for you long before? Can you find it in your heart, Lord, to forgive me? And God isn't even interested in what you have to say because guess what? He already has. He already did. The father had already come to terms with this, fix this, said, you know what? This thing will just run its course because I know that my love for you is stronger and that my love for you will draw you back to myself. It was he who first loved us. We didn't find him, right? It was he who first loved us. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. We give you praise. We give you praise. Let's go down a few slides. I'll tell you where to stop. Next one. Okay, hold that. Hold that. We know, we know that Adam, when he ate of the apple, the tree, the tree, Adam no longer saw himself in the image of God. Now, when God made Adam, he made him in his image after his likeness. When Adam ate of the tree, scripture says their eyes were opened. What were their eyes opened to? Their eyes were opened to see their earthy form, their earthiness. Okay, pastor, come again. So, pastor will be God in the garden this time. Here's God. God has created his son. Turn face me here, sir. God has created his son, Adam, in his image and likeness, right? Now, I did the unthinkable. I ate his apple, right? I shouldn't have done that. Okay. So, <clears throat> I realized... I'm supposed to be in your image. I'm supposed to be like you. I'm supposed to reflect you. I'm supposed to be like you, have dominion like you, walk like you, talk like you, tell everything around me. I am God's representative here. And what is true of him is true of me. So you better obey me, right? Okay, lion, you better obey me, okay? Right. Okay. Now I ate of this tree. And I'm saying, wait a minute, I am just like the earth. I am just like the lion. I'm just like the lamb. I'm not like the God who made me. Something happened. I am not worthy to be called your son. I must leave. And God opens the door and he exits the garden. Because he doesn't see himself like the creator God who made him after his image and likeness, he sees himself an earth man, subject to the earth. And God is saying, no, 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 Adam, wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. Yeah, hold my back a little bit there. <laughs> All right, right, stop, right? Um, I have an answer. I'll fix this. Thank you, sir. And here's how I'm going to fix this. You can't fix it. No one in human history can fix it. So you know what I'm going to do? I'll fix this myself. That's the story of the gospel. I'll fix it myself. Because you can't fix it. So you know what I'm going to do? I will leave the abode of heaven. I will take on this same form of earth. I will be born of the Virgin Mary. I will live among you and live life like you. And you know why? You know why? Come again, pastor. So now I am, I am, um, I am Christ in the earth, right? So pastor is the man now. And you see me, are, are we different? Yeah. Are we different? We are the same. Now we can see Christ in our image yeah. and after our likeness because he took on our human form. Thank you, pastor. He took on human form. Wait a minute. I look like you. I sound like you. I can walk and talk like you. You have authority. I can have it. You have dominion. I can have it. You have power in the earth. I can have it. When you speak, things happen. So when I speak, things must happen. And when I speak, sickness must go. When I speak, this problem must stop speaking in my air. It's not a devil speaking in your air. It's you. It's your problem in your head speaking to yourself. Come out! Yeah. And it must go. I 
I'm now looking like Christ. Because now he fixed what was wrong in the garden. You were made to be in his image and likeness. And we forgot that. We lost it. Christ came in our image and likeness, taken on human form. So when I see the Christ, these guys, Peter, James, and John, and these other disciples, they lived among him. They ate with him. He was a man and God. And this tells me that if he did it, I can do it too. I ha- it, it takes away the excuse. I have seen God in human flesh. So God can be in this human flesh. And now, pastor, I have to be very careful how I talk to my brother. Because God is in human flesh. Amen. I have to be very careful how I treat my sister. Because I can't just talk to them any old way, you know. You'll be speaking to God in human flesh. And the same way you can't speak to me the same. Because now we understand God. We understand ourselves. We understand each other. And the problems of the world will be solved. There'll be no crime because I wouldn't want to steal what you have. Before it had to be a commandment. Thou shalt not steal, remember? That didn't stop anybody, did it? Because it's still going on all now. That doesn't stop anybody. But when I understand that it is the God in me, I'm not going to take anything from you because like I take it out from God. It's like the garden of Eden all over again. I can't take God's apple. God in human flesh. If I want to see God now, where do I look? God isn't somewhere in the sky. I know you like to think when we get there on streets of gold. Do you know that streets of gold can be very slippery? You just break a fall on a street of gold. You ever fall on gold? <laughs> I don't think my shoes are designed to walk on streets of gold. It's a slippery slope. You can get seriously hurt. It's not about walking on streets of gold, my friend. It's about seeing yourself in the image of God. Let me try and close here a bit. Can we go to the next slide? Jeremiah 1.5. Let me tell you who you really are. Let me tell you who you really are. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And the same scripture, what's that same scripture in a different version of the Bible? It says, before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. You know why? Because I'm God. You know why? Because I made you, right? You came out of me. I had holy plans for you. Yes, God has plans for you. When we see people live in a particular life, and so it's simply because they don't know this. They don't know this. Guess what? We didn't know it before either. We know it now. We know that God has a holy vocation, a holy plan for us. He put us in this earth. He, sent, he didn't send me here to suffer, okay? When he sent me here, he sent me with everything I need on the inside of me. I didn't follow his plan. Good, good. I didn't follow his plan. I got myself into some trouble. Yeah. And now I have to struggle through until I find out again. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Yeah. The plans of God for my life. And when I begin to understand it all over again, I begin to see things differently. So I stopped blaming God. I stopped blaming God because I was born into a poor family, into a poor background, or I didn't have this, or I didn't have dad growing up, and all of this, and all of these things happening. I stopped blaming God for that. I'll tell you a secret. Before you came here, there was a discussion in heaven between you and God. And you decided when you would come. And you decided where you would live and who you would be born to. You decided these things and you said yes to God. And that is why you are here. Now you've forgotten about that conversation you had with God and when you said yes. But I know you said yes because you are here. The fact that you are here tells me that you said yes to God. So now we can't turn this whole thing around on God and say, God, you see, you see, you see, you see. God will say, you said yes. You agreed to come. And the same way Christ agreed to come. 
pretty much the same. You said yes. Let's do the next scripture. This is our last scripture, our last scripture. Last scripture, pastor. Let's warm up the food, okay? Jeremiah 29, 11. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 11. I know a lot of you thought. You notice my language now. I know a lot of you thought God was against you. God was after you for different reasons. I know you thought God was angry with you for something you did 15, 20 years ago, maybe even last week or last night. I know you thought that God is angry and he won't forgive you. I hope the lesson of the prodigal son fixed that. I hope today's message fixes that. But look at Jeremiah 29, 11 here for a sec. I know what I'm doing. God speaking here, right? I'd like to think God knows what he's doing, Pastor. I like to think so. I like to think I could throw myself into what he is doing. Because whatever he's doing will be properly planned out, perfectly planned out. And I will not lose in the end. So I can trust him that he knows what he's doing. We trust him, we trust him. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Just like the father of the prodigal son, he says, wait, I know. I know this boy will come back home. That's why I'm not sending any Mercedes Benz to bring him back. He'll come back for himself. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of your family. He's going to take care of all that concerns you. And stop worrying about the will, okay? Stop worrying about the will. He's going to take care of all of that. He says, plans not to abandon you. In your darkest moment, I will not leave you alone. You know why? Because I'm right here. We stop listening to his voice, so we think he's left. But he's always there. He's always speaking. It's just that sometimes we allow the crisis outside of us to dominate our hearing. So we only hear the voice of what the crisis is saying. And we don't hear the still small voice on the inside of us. But he's there. Because he's promised never to leave us nor forsake us. The plans to take care of you and not to abandon you, but plans to give you the future you said yes to. Plans to give you the future you said yes to. Pastor, can you please? Plans to give you a hope for the future. Plans to give you the future you hoped for. God isn't about to destroy you, to destroy the world, and send everybody to hell. God is about giving you a better future. You want a better future for your children? You want a better future for your children? Get them into the house of the Lord. Get them wrapped into the arms of God. Get them so God involved that they know where he's taking them. And no matter where they go, this God will take care of them. Amen. You want to save your family? Stop telling that person what he's doing will send him straight to hell. Stop it. Instead, offer them love. Offer them hope. Because you told them a hundred times, stop doing that. And did it work? You told them a hundred times you're going to go to hell for that one. And you told one or two of them, you know, there's a special place in hell for you. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. But this is not our God. This is not the God we serve. The God we serve is a God of eternal love. Crazy love. Not the way humans love. Humans love very selfishly. We love for what we can get. God doesn't love for what he can get. What can we get from, him, from us? What can we give him anyway? He loves us for what he can give. Because love doesn't take. Love gives. <laughs> Young people, you want to know if he's really in love? We'll always give. 
not take. You want to know if this God really loves you? He's always giving. He has everything to give and he gives it freely. He doesn't put conditions on it. He does like dangling a bait for a fish, right? But a fish. Say, if you come for this bait, I'll catch him. And keep pulling it back. That's not God. God knows what you have need of. He knows the dire need of your heart. And he says, you know what? I'll give it. And you don't have to do anything to get it. Receive it with thanksgiving. I bless you. I declare you are blessed. And no curses upon you. Don't think that you are cursed. You are blessed. You are a child of God. No curses come upon you or your family. Be free from that now. No matter what has happened in the past, that's by the cross already. The cross X'd that out. <laughs> Today, God is offering you a chance to live a new life. The question is, is, do you receive it? And will you live it and live it the right way? Amen. Father, we thank you. We bless you, oh Lord. We give you praise. Thank you for your patience, everybody. I hope the word really meant something and that it did something to you. We're just going to pray for a few folks here. Pastor, <clears throat> thank you, Lord. We worship you. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. We receive you, Lord, in a way we have never received you before. Say that with me. I receive you, O Lord, in a way I have never received you before. Reveal yourself to me. Now reveal yourself through me. Reveal yourself, O oh God, to me. Reveal yourself in me. And reveal yourself through me. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in my life. I receive grace today. I receive mercy. I receive healing. I receive forgiveness because it has already been made available. I don't have to ask. I receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive this love of God into your heart. Receive it. Receive a God of love, not a God of vengeance or a God of wrath or a God who's angry. He's a God who loves all, receives all, forgives all. He's a God who loves all, receives all, forgives all. Say it with me. He's a God who loves all, receives all, and forgives all. And he's doing that for me. He's doing that for my family. He's doing that for everybody that concerns me, that is connected to me. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, we worship you. Stand with me. Stand with me.